Uh, thank you, Dr. Brunt. Uh, on the American College of Surgeons community's website, uh, one of the commonly discussed topics is the gallbladder. And one of the gallbladder issues that seems to have surgeons conflicted and confused is the use of percutaneous cholecystostomy and interval cholecystectomy. Well, this dilemma is not new. In fact, in a recently discovered manuscript from the Old Globe Theater, Hamlet agonized to drain or not to drain, whether it is nobler in operating to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous inflammation or to put a tube inside this bag of troubles and call IR to end them. And that's a question mark down there. The critical questions include which patients with acute cholecystitis are benefited from percoli rather than early cholecystectomy or other treatment. What predicts recurrence? Who should undergo interval cholecystectomy and when? And what factors determine the outcome of an interval operation? We are vexed because there is no high-grade evidence to inform us on, this, on these questions. Uh, there are a couple small randomized clinical trials that are of little value, or a few administrative database and systematic reviews. In fact, there was the administrative database uh, from the Sparks uh, a database that was presented by the Stony Brook group here two days ago. But the vast majority of studies are single center retrospective experiences. Uh, there are often no comparator groups of patients who were treated for acute, acute cholecystitis by other methods. Uh, there is little standardization of the uh, selection criteria for percoli patients, the diagnostic criteria, the criteria for de determining severity or comorbidities. There are variations in the outcomes analyzed and the length of follow-up, and there are no standard selection criteria by which certain patients get interval cholecystectomy. If we can understand these limitations, however, we can summarize what we might know from the best evidence that we have available. Patients who get percutaneous cholecystostomy either do so most of the time due to the anticipated severity of the local inflammatory response or the anticipated operative risk, or it might be both of these factors. It's usually not specified. Uh, operative risk is usually considered high because of comorbid conditions or because of physiologic decompensation of the patient. There are different types of patients who undergo percoli, and they may well have different outcomes, and this goes beyond calculus or acalculus disease. There are some patients who come in with severe acute cholecystitis that is causing organ dysfunction, grade three, Tokyo criteria. There are other patients who have pre-existing chronic comorbidities or who are clinically ill already from other conditions, and then they develop acute cholecystitis of varying severity and there are some patients who have a tube placed because they have sepsis, but the origin is uncertain. Obviously, patients who do get a percoli are sicker than other patients. They tend to be older. They tend to have a higher severity grade of acute cholecystitis, more comorbidities, more sepsis, more ICU days, and more often have acalculus disease. The procedure itself is technically successful about 98% of the time there's about a 7% procedural complication rate. Uh, Bio-leak, bleeding, sepsis, perforation, the mortality is under 1%. 85 to 90% of patients who have a tube place improve, but 10 to 15% do not. Amongst that group, Amongst the group that does not improve, about one-third to one-half of those go on to die of biliary sepsis. About one-half to two-thirds of those then undergo an urgent operation, which is infrequently completed laparoscopically, and has about a 10% mortality. So some of those patients are salvaged. The overall hospital index admission mortality of patients who receive a, receive a percutaneous cholecystostomy tube is 15 to 25 percent. 
This is more often due to underlying disease than to biliary sepsis. There are, however, two groups of patients who get a tube that might have a higher index mortality rate. The first group are those patients who were initially admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of something other than acute cholecystitis. In other words, they develop acute cholecystitis in the hospital. The second group that seemed to have a higher index mortality is the group that has the tube placed because of sepsis of uncertain origin. What becomes of their survivors? Uh, the 30-day hospital mortality rate with a per coli tube in place post-discharge is 25%. Most of these are due to underlying disease. There is a high rate of tube dysfunction, usually dislodgement or occlusion, and a high proportion of patients require multiple tube reinterventions. Of patients who are discharged with a tube in place, that do not undergo interval cholecystectomy, about 20 to 40% will have recurrent acute cholecystitis, cholangitis, or biliary pancreatitis, and the 30-day readmission rate for biliary issues is about 15 to 30%. Uh, some of these patients will then have an interval operation, some will have a repeat tube placement, and some will die. Now, 20 to 40% recurrence amongst those that don't undergo an interval cholecystectomy actually means that most patients who are discharged and do not have a cholecystectomy will not have a recurrence. And some of these patients can have their tubes removed. How often this can be done is not clear, but the largest single center experience is from the Cleveland Clinic. They had nearly 400 patients. Of their patients who survived the hospital and were discharged and did not have an interval cholecystectomy, about one-third had their tubes removed, but about 15% of those required the tubes to be replaced again. So the safe criteria for tube removal are symptom resolution, the absence of stones, and a patent cystic duct and common duct on a tube cholangiography. Who should have an elective interval cholecystectomy? This will decrease biliary recurrence, obviously. But other, perhaps in the presence of stones, we have no reliable predictors for who should get an interval cholecystectomy. The patients who do undergo this tend to be younger. They have less comorbidities. They have had shorter index hospital stays, less need for mechanical ventilation, and fewer prior abdominal operations. So let me summarize in this slide what happens to patients who get operated on at some point after a percutaneous cholecystostomy. We already discussed uh, the early group that have an urgent operation. Another five to 10% of patients after discharge will require an urgent operation because of recurrence. Any urgent operation is usually not accomplished laparoscopically. It has a major morbidity rate of about 25% and a mortality of zero to 12%. 30 to 40% of patients who are discharged have an elective interval cholecystectomy. Depending upon the institution you're at, about 10 to 40% of these are started open from the get-go. About 20 to 30% are converted that are attempted laparoscopically, so the overall successful laparoscopic rate's about 50%. Uh, the usual reasons for conversions are the severity of the local inflammatory conditions. In fact, having a percutaneous cholecystostomy tube itself is an independent predictor of conversion, and the number of prior operations on the abdomen is an independent predictor of conversion. Uh, the operative morbidity rate is 15%, mortality 0 to 3%. But those patients that have a successful laparoscopic interval cholecystectomy do have less morbidity, less mortality, shorter hospital stay, and uh, shorter ICU stays. These two groups are not equivalent, but if you try to compare patients who have an interval cholecystectomy after a tube to patients who either undergo early or delayed cholecystectomy for acute cholecystitis without a tube, those that have had a percutaneous cholecystostomy have a higher conversion rate, longer operative time, and length of stay, and importantly, an increased risk of complications such as SSIs and particularly biliary complications with bile leak rates up to 10% and major bile duct injuries up to 2.5%. A percutaneous cholecystostomy tube does not make the subsequent operation easier. The predictors of outcome are the severity of the local inflammatory conditions and the patient's comor comorbid condition. So to summarize, 
per coli can be highly successful for the initial treatment of acute cholecystitis. The procedural complication rate is reasonably low, but there is a high rate of tube dysfunction that will require maintenance. Uh, there is a high rate of uh, recurrent biliary events among survivors, which can be decreased by interval cholecystectomy, but because most patients don't get recurrence, interval cholecystectomy can be uh, probably withheld for the most compromised patients. If you do an interval operation, it is associated with a high conversion rate and an important morbidity rate. If it can be successfully accomplished laparoscopically, the outcomes appear to be better than if it has to be done open. But the truth is we really have inadequate data for solid evidence-based recommendations as to who either should get a percoli to begin with and which of those patients uh, should then have an elective interval cholecystectomy. Like Hamlet, you have to try to make the best decision you can. Uh, and one might argue that Hamlet did not always make the best decisions. And in fact, if you are a named character in Hamlet, you have a mortality of 53%. Thank you. <laughs>